tell me why you want to share your story. I think when the severity of abuse gets to where I ended up with on January 6th, five years ago, most women in that situation never get to speak out because they're dead. And so I so much value the privacy of my daughters and myself and my family, but I felt it was just critical to speak out and to caution women in terms of getting involved with someone who shows these abusive tendencies. In fact, it was your 12-year-old daughter who helped convince you to step forward. That's pretty powerful. She said, Mom, you said from the very beginning that you wanted to help women and talk to them about the signs, and this is a way to reach so many women. And she encouraged me to speak out. Your husband had quite a resume, though. Um, he worked in the White House as deputy counsel for President Bush, chief legal adv advisor at Xerox Corporation, undersecretary at the Commerce Department. He was a very powerful man. Incredibly powerful. Do you know what he was like at work? I've heard what he was like at work, and I think he was an incredibly tough person. Did he like that reputation? He loved it. One time we were at a dinner, and he, there was a man who was just kind of shaking when he saw him, and he said, I ruined his career. He crossed me, and I destroyed him. Sounds like he had a smirk on his face when he said he it. He did. The verbal and emotional abuse to me seems far more sinister than physical because the physical leaves a mark. You have proof. You can show somebody, look what he did to me. When it's verbal and emotional abuse, you don't have that. Well, and that's where I thought it would always stay because he had made his life about ethics and about corporate ethics and government ethics and was so respectful of the law. And I thought it would not become abusive, but you're so right in that it is so difficult because it's not it tangible. Comes, it's not, but it's like that rage that where it could turn physical is so, it's seething right there underneath the surface whenever you challenge that person or don't do as they want. And I just would say to him, I think you're going to hit me eventually. And he would say, oh, Mary Margaret, I would never, ever, ever hurt you. And I said, you're this close. But you didn't think he was going to follow through physically. Or did you? I was very scared and I saw his rage particularly on the day of the attack right there and I was so careful to not trigger it and while I was fearful of it and I could see it was escalating you just can't imagine that someone's going to try to kill you I want you to bring me into that master bedroom on the night of January 6th. You put the children to bed, mm -hmm. your baby in her crib, and then you go into the master bedroom, mm -hmm. and he's there in his pajamas? Yes. And what happens? He came at me, he put his hands out, and he put his hands around my neck, and tackled me to the floor and started slamming my head into the floor while he was strangling me. And he, as he was slamming my head into the floor, he said, I'm killing you. And I thought, I'm dying. And then I was thinking, I've got to hold it together. I have to stay conscious so I can save the girls. I have to get help here. He got off of me and he left the room and he started to go into the master bathroom and he said don't touch the alarm and there was an alarm uh, pad in the master bedroom and I thought to myself I have to get the police here to save the children and 
So I pulled myself over to the dresser by the alarm and pulled myself up on it, and the alarm goes off. He comes rushing back from the master bathroom and tackles me. And he says he's going to the kitchen to get a knife and to kill himself, is what he said. And I thought, well, knife is probably meant for me. Um, and then I blacked out. And then the next thing I remember I came to, and I thought, I heard commotion. I heard him doing something in the master bathroom. And by the grace of God or angels, I just popped up and I ran to our daughter's room and I said to the car right now, daddy's trying to kill me. You got the baby. I got, I got the baby. I held her like a football under my arm and I went down the back stairs like tripping all the way. At that moment you knew your children were safe yes. because they were out of that house. Yes. The power of a mom trying to make sure her children are safe. Yes. What do you want to say to anyone who is listening out there, who's in a bad relationship, who is scared? The more people know that you bring people in to help you, the less uh, in danger you are because the abuser has made you the problem. And to the extent you feel like you can lean on other people and the resources being you know, women advocacy groups and support networks and the police, Someone said to me recently that you, you are responsible for your own reputation and you feel like you want to protect this person who you always hope could be better, but that person is responsible for their own reputation and you're responsible for your own safety. And by telling your story, you're hoping that other women will find that path of, to safety as well. Yes, and realizing that they do not need to do this alone. Tell a friend. Tell your mother, tell your sister, tell someone. Right. Because when you're silent, he is so emboldened, your abuser is so emboldened in that you are the problem and he's right. And once that shift happens, and they'll plead to you and say, you know, you know, I don't want you talking badly about me. And that's why that very succinct statement of you're responsible for your own reputation. And I want you for nothing, I want you to have a good one. <laughs>